Today I appear to be driving in someone's rather nice country house drawing room. Yes, I'm in a Vanden Plas Princess 3 litre. This is a 1961 Mark I Vanden Plas Princess 3 litre. Rather lovely Pininfarina designed lump of poshness and a beautiful example of badge engineering by BMC in the early 60s as it shared its shell engine running gear with the Austin A99 Westminster and the Wolsey 699, two rather different cars which were rather the same in a funny sort of way, but were all styled individually using different grills, lights, bumpers and um, colour schemes to create their own unique take on the same underlying shape. Let's take a look around. Each of the three cars in the Pininfarina range got their own unique style thanks to the face that was changed on each car. In this particular case, it's got different lights, different cowls, spotlights, horns hidden behind these big, quite impressive grills, and this very impressive peaked radiator cowl giving quite an imposing, err, uh, stately grill. From dead on the front, it looks kind of like a Volvo 140 from a few years later. Although the Volvo somehow manages to look friendly and welcoming, whereas this looks more stately and imposing and a bit like it's looking down on you. Here under the bonnet, you'll find the BMC C Series engine, 2912 cc's of glory in a straight six format, which in this application is badged as a princess engine. It's a simple and robust old unit. It's a quite heavy engine. And with the twin SUs over there, it will generate 103 horsepower and 157 pound-feet of torque. That is good for a 0 to 60 time, not that these cars are particularly 0 to 60 cars. That will carry this heavy wood and leather laden beast from 0 to 60 in 16 seconds and give it a top speed of 99 miles an hour. At the same time, giving a respectable-ish 21 miles to the gallon. Visually, probably the most defining characteristic of the Farina bodied cars are these wings. So, so American, so influenced by transatlantic style and rock and roll culture. That it looks a little bit out of place on a car which is aimed squarely so at the top of the market, but that's where the styling was in those days. Although it marks the car out as being a little bit anachronistic and very much of its time, it's a wonderful detail and it just looks so good and it just marks these cars out instantly. If you were in traffic back in the 60s and you saw these fins moving through traffic towards you, you might slow down a bit thinking it might be a police Wolsey coming the other way and then be disappointed to find it as your bank manager in his Vanden Plas. Before we go too much further with this review, we need to deal with the elephant in the room. If I told you this car ran on chocolate and every car came with a free polar bear, I'll get less comments than however I say this name. If I say Vanden Plas, Vanden Plas, Vanden Plas, it doesn't matter, someone's going to say I've said it wrong. However, I have checked this very thoroughly. I've checked a number of websites, I've checked a number of books, and the most helpful of all was the rather wonderful AR Online website, which is a host of beautifully and thoroughly researched information. The name Vanden Plas, with flat sounding A's, like in the word park, and a hard S like in the word miss, is of Flemish Dutch origin and the company was Belgian. It's a name, it means on or of the pond. And so using the Flemish Dutch Belgian pronunciation, it is Vanden Plas. Any comments saying I've got it wrong will be deleted or answered rudely because that is correct, I have checked. So there. <laughs> You can tell you're in a quality car when it takes two hands to lift the boot up. It, actually, it's not that heavy, but it is on quite a nice sprung thing, so it stays where you put it. Um, but it's not as big as you might imagine, because looking at the length of those big wings, you'd think it's a really huge boot, but really, it ends just here, so it's not that big. Your, your corpse carrying capabilities are severely curtailed by the fact the fuel tank runs full width between the wheel arches. So it's a fairly safe location in case the car is rear-ended or in some kind of incident, but at the same time, it does really kind of limit your your load space area. It's nicely carpeted throughout on the, on the walls, the back, the floor, everything. It's being a, a VDP, it's going to be richly covered in nice stuff. One thing that does stun me is this jack. Look how tall this is. How high do you have to jack this car to lift it off the ground? Well, the ride is fairly soft, but I didn't realize it was that soft. 1961 car is basically a 50s car underneath. Uh, there's no light in the boot, no nothing else. But look how thick this sound deadening is. This is sound deadening in the boot. This isn't even you know, sound deadening for the interior passenger area. Just think how thick the sound deadening on the, the carpet is in the passenger area to make this thing a thing of luxury and beauty. Listen to this. 
that clunk, that thump shut, that is the mark of quality, isn't it? That is the real, in modern cars, they have a thing called perceived quality. In cars of this era, it's actual quality. The Farina body BMC cars, whether it's the Austin, which is like the self-made man who's made some money and wants something posh to show that he's now the manager of his own business. The Woolsey, which was a bit rakish, also the police car. And this, this is the, not even the poor man's Rolls Royce, this is the rich man's not using his Rolls Royce today because he wants something smaller car, were the absolute best of the best from BMC. They were taking on like, the, the posh Rovers, they were taking on the big Humbers from the Roots Group, that kind of thing. Um, expensive, top-end vehicles. If you're looking at sort of Mercedes E-Class, BMW 5, and, in fact, no, not even E-Class, but S-Class and 7 Series um, kind of competitors in the market of the day. Well, maybe it would be 5 Series because the police use them rather than the Wolseys now. I don't know. Things have become blurred. To differentiate the VDP cars from the run-of-the-mill Farinas, these had to have the most opulent and impressive interior you could imagine. Forget touchscreens, iPads and interactivity. In 1961, luxury meant country house drawing room. So unfinished shells were sent from the Cowley production line down to Kingsbury in North London, where Vanden Plaats were based, where they would install their own interiors, their, all the trimmings, and use their own unique paint combinations to give them their own special look, and all the trim on the exterior. The bright work was unique to these as well. Now, the interior of this car is exceptionally posh. From the floor up, we've got thick, thick carpet, which is over far thicker sound deadening than you'd find in the other brothers and sisters in the range. There's this fabulous burr walnut dashboard. This is a huge slab of tree. I mean, look how big this is. And it folds down below as well. And the door cappings and all four doors are the same. The headlining is this thick felt material, giving more sound deadening, giving more warmth in winter, giving just an air of just quiet comfort and hush. And up here in the headlining, as well as the very tiny rear view mirror, we've got these sort of semi-transparent perspex tinted sun visors which are very nice on their little chromey surrounds. And of course the seats, this is like a semi-bench seat. Fold these two individual armrests up and you've got a full width seat if you really want to. Otherwise you've got a big comfortable throne of a chair which you sink into. There's no, no sporty pretensions and bucket seats here. This is just a big slab of deep high quality leather on I'm gonna say horsehair, it's probably not, is it? It's something equally posh though, and very deep and comfy. On the doors below the wood capping, you've got this matching leather door card, big door handle and grip and armrest, so you get a seating position of relaxed comfort. Only manual windows, of course. Um, that was the standard in those days. Cr big chrome door handle to open the door. Let's do that clunk again. Ah, clunk. And a little quarter light. A nice little quarter light just there. Very pretty. The dash top is very, very slim from the, the padded area with, behind your knuckles down to the glass itself. It does have demist vents in it as well. And a little ashtray in the top for your cigars or possibly a pipe actually, I might suggest. There's a very coach built feel about the way the instruments and the switches are laid out in here and kind of recessed in little panels and things, or not in some cases. The speedo on the right, which goes all the way to 120, is about two, three centimetres recessed inside the dashboard and to the left there's a matching circle hole which has got your amps, your oil, your radiator temperature and your fuel gauge all just clustered neatly in there looking quite balanced and nice. And down to the right of that you've just got a small panel with one warning light for the brakes, it's a servo on it so I guess if the brake fluid level goes and the servo stops working that will flash up. S and H is one toggle switch, uh, side and headlight, F and F, fog and fog, front and front, flash and, I don't know, something else. In the centre, everything is just spaced out very much in the way it says, I don't need to cluster things together. I don't need to group things. I've got all the space in the world. I'm gonna put this here and this here. I don't care that it's that far from anything else. It doesn't matter to me because I've got an entire tree to live on. The Smith's clock up the top is an absolute thing of beauty. It's a bit art deco with this kind of square face with the uh, stretched octagon cut out for the hands behind the number plane and in the the wood as well it gives it a real 1930s feel really or maybe the early 40s perhaps and below that we've got the chrome fronted Motorola radio it looks absolutely stunning and either side of the radio there are the heating and ventilation controls which is uh, it feels quite novel to have that in a car of this vintage so you've got your temperature on the left 
and the direction on the right is set to defrost and hot right now because it's about two degrees outside. And we have a big glove box, but I need the key to open that so I won't. But I will call this the upper tea shelf. Now in the centre, we have got a sudden unexpected cluster of things. Heater, pull, turn that off and on. Panel lights to dim that. Uh, the wiper, park, N and P, delay and fast I'm gonna call that. The choke, out slightly because it's still quite cold. A warning light, cigar lighter, heavily used. And map light, so a little light somewhere under the dashboard, which, oh, down there. And this is an interesting one down here. Push for overdrive. It's a three speed column change gear shift on this car. Synchro mesh on all three, but overdrive on the top two. So technically it's a five speed gearbox. Finally, down here in the center, there's not much else of a column, but there is your central T-shelf, which is a large square leather bound center with rubber edges. So if you have a tea spillage, mop it up quickly because you don't want to spoil the leather, but the rubber will stop it going into the carpet big enough to hold your three litre princess operation handbook. Which I might, would suggest is well worth a read and is full of extremely useful facts. Flashing indicator warning lamp, bulb changing. Oh, here we go, let's move on to that right now. Here is your indicator switch in the center of the steering wheel with a green light that flashes when you're turning. And here's instructions on how to take that green cover off and change the bulb when it fails. Interesting. The steering wheel itself is massive. It's an absolute bus wheel of a thing. And it's got a uh, semi-circular horn ring. Should we drill the horn behind those grills? Whoa, that's dignified. That's like a cruise ship coming in. I like that. And because the indicators are up here and the lights are over here, the only control around the wheel itself is this column change, which is towards you and down for first, away and up for second, away and down for third, and then towards you and up for reverse simples as they say and the last control is of course the dip main beam switch which is a foot pedal down behind the clutch which I've always thought a slightly crazy and daft thing to do and the last thing to look at on the dashboard is of course the lower tea shelf this car has got a big plastic tray below the main dashboard where you can put odds and sods it's just tall enough for a small cup of tea a dainty cup of tea if having a cup and saucer kind of cup that will fit on here so you've got three potential tea shelf areas in this car because it is landed gentry they will need to take tea at some point if you stop at three o'clock in the afternoon there will be uh, an array of cakes on the run side we have sandwiches crusts cut off on the left tea in the center that's how they rolled in the 60s if you're posh and in my imagination now, i don't know why this would be but the passenger side has got a little kind of cubby hole in the door pocket. The driver's side hasn't. Gosh, you sit high in these rear seats. The same big thump of that door. You're sitting really, really high up on this bench. I'm surprised how, how much altitude I have. It's like I'm in the rear seats of a Discovery 3 or 4 looking from that kind of uh, grandstand seating thing they have. But no, I'm in the back seat of a car where I can look over the driver's head virtually. Lucky the headroom is impressive, so I don't feel like I'm banging my head. But it does mean that my knees are sort of bent straight down. And so I've not got to crunch or have my knees sitting up in an awkward position. I won't get sort of numb feet or pins and needles on a long drive. So uh, it's actually, yeah, surprisingly comfortable. And there is a nice armrest here to turn this into two large comfy seats. Same lovely creamy blue-gray leather again, which looks nice. Same big armrest. And we've got little uh, elasticated cubby holes in the doors again, same as in the front. And of course, same nice big chrome door handle, manual window winders, and little carpet doodars so you don't kick the, uh, the leather panel and scratch it. No seat belts. But there are quarter lights and uh, it looks like wood, but I believe it's actually Bakelite perhaps or something similar. Ashtrays individually in both seats. And up in the top, we do have these rather nice sort of art deco -y looking interior lights on both the B posts. And that is kind of it for the interior of the back. It's just a, a large, comfortable place to be and you bring your own entertainment. Oh, isn't that thing grumble into life? The old straight six C series does have that kind of truck-like quality to it, doesn't it? The real thumping grumble it chokes out a bit, so it's uh, running a little fast. A couple of uh, the quirks of this car, the real quirks and possibly copyrighted features: column shift onto reverse, and because it's got a bench seat, sort of, the handbrake is down here on the right. Now 
no power steering, so it is quite heavy. Wow, those brakes are sharp. So it's quite heavy at low speed pulling out the car park. But once we get out onto the road, it does lighten up an awful lot. Now you'll notice I'm not wearing a seatbelt for the simple reason there aren't any. We die like men, as they say. This thing absolutely wafts. It's just so quiet and refined in here. That super thick underlay under the carpet, that sound deadening really does work wonders, making this thing just whisper quiet. I must admit, three-speed gearboxes always throw me a little bit when I'm going through corners. There's a gear I think I should be in third gear in a five-speed or six-speed car. I'm always thinking, oh, hang on, should I be in second for this? Should I hang on in third because it's going to be a lower gear, third gear? I don't know. See, that felt too high, well, felt too fast for the second gear I put it into. But third felt a bit too low geared. I just need to say a big thank you to Sussex Classics and Crawley Down in, in Sussex, obviously, for the loan of this car for the review today. This car is currently for sale there. If you want to take a look at it, check out their website in the link in the description below. Uh, now we're on the road, the steering's lightened up a lot. There's a certain disconnectedness to it. It's cam and peg steering, so it's a little bit woolly, to be honest. But it does have other advances in the fact it has independent front suspension with coil springs, although the rear is a live rear axle on half elliptical leafs. So it gives it a measure of good control as you corner and things, but at the same time it's that kind of old, comfortable waftiness from the rear. Okay, three point turn time. Visibility is pretty good. Uh, the steering is nice and light when you're going backwards, bizarrely. You can sort of tell why the police were enamoured of these in the Wolsey form. Sorry, in the Woolsey form. I can't say that word and I know it, don't pick me up on it. This car's got such a big, imposing presence. And even though the 0-60 is 16 seconds, that's not slow for the 1960s or the 1950s, which is the kind of cars they would have been chasing. And it just feels rapid and powerful and such a high sitting position. You can really see a long way over down the road, really. So there's a little Kia Picanto, I think, in front of me right now, which uh, I can basically see over the roof of it. And that's quite a tall, small car. It's a very comfortable thing to drive. You just kind of relax into these big leather armchairs, drape your arm over the armrest, and the car just kind of meanders down the road if you're just letting it flow. I've said this before, but I do really like column changes. They're really easy to use once you learn them. Same as in any other gearbox, really. If you're going from a four speed to a six speed, you have to learn it for a second. And this is quite an unusual car in that it does have a manual gearbox because the kind of market this was sold to, automatics really were very much the go-to choice because it was a big posh car, you know, bank managers, landed gentry. Posh, probably older drivers would have gone for the VDP option. So it's quite interesting to find that third pedal. I absolutely love the sound of this car, most of all, as you're pulling away, low revs, low gears, that kind of rumbling thunder. It says power, dignity, respect me, respect my authority. No, it doesn't say that at all. That's very different entirely. Although as you are pulling out, you do have a slight limit to the fact that although you've got great visibility around here, there's a six light, or sorry, it's a seven light car because you've got quarter lights in all four doors and the rear window. This little mirror here is kind of convex so you get an amazing view at the back window but those little mirrors down there on the front uh, I, 
I've said this before so many times, I can't stand them, I can see literally nothing. I could spend all morning getting someone to move them for me and I would still see nothing. They're an absolute pain. That's why they call them wing mirrors, but wing mirrors in their truest form are rubbish. What's not rubbish on this car though are the brakes. Hold on to something. That was barely a dab on the brakes. I didn't expect it to lock up honestly, I was expecting it to just stand on its nose. It's got disc brakes on the front and drums on the rear and that big servo you may have noticed under the bonnet when we did the engine look around. And this thing absolutely stands on its nose if you hit the brakes hard. That being a a luxury vehicle of the day, they were throwing in what was the latest technology, you know, that and the independent front suspension. Now the company Vanden Plas actually dates back to 1898, where it's a Belgian coach builders. They were taken over, they were bought out by their English manager Edward Fox in 1923, when uh, the company was about to go under and become a British company then, based in Kingsbury in London. And after the war in 1946, they were again having slightly troubled times. And that was when Leonard Lord of Austin um, made an offer of £90,000 for the company, which they accepted. And then Van den Plaas became part of the range. Ah, oh, the smell of this thing is just incredible. 50s and 60s cars do have their own unique smell. It's the, um, the stuffing they use in the seats and the carpets are just a different material. Add in the wood, the leather, oh, it's years of leather treatments and wood polish. It's like going around a National Trust property on wheels. So the VDP Princess 3 litre ran from 1959 to 1964. This particular car was built in early 1960 apparently and not registered though until 1961. In 1961 there was a facelift which made the car visually almost identical but actually about five centimeters longer and threw in a few more options like air conditioning and uh, the famous picnic tables that everyone always thinks of when they think of a, a Vandom Plas uh, became standard. They're not on this car sadly. As the BMC Empire merged into the BL Empire and things moved on as it stopped being a company in its own right in the end and became more of a badge. It didn't die completely as uh, Jaguars and Daimlers used it and let's not forget the notable high point of the Allegro VDP from the late 70s which is possibly exactly what the uh, Belgian originators of the company were dreaming of when they started in 1898. Thank you for joining me today driving a very large, heavy, leather clad, wooden panelled slice of rolling opulence. It's been a pleasure to be at the wheel of this thing and uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching. If you have, please hit like, please hit subscribe, it makes a massive difference to the channel and I'll see you again next time in something very different.